I'm very happy today to introduce our very own uh, Vincent Adam, who will be talking about the uh, SPAS method for Markovian GP. And uh, if you don't know, Vincent is working uh, at Second Mind part time and at uh, Alto University at the same time. Um, Vincent, the floor is yours. Okay, so I'll share my screen. Let me know if you can see. Yeah, we can see. Okay, so um, thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm going to talk today about sparse methods for Markovian Gaussian processes. Um, as a short outline, I'll talk a bit about Gaussian processes, maybe going a, a bit back, even if it's uh, our focus. Uh, I'll talk about sparse GPs and actually maybe motivate a bit more doing thinking differently than what we normally do about in France and optimization. Uh, and then I'll talk about the Markovian Gaussian process that can be seen as a SDE, that can have an equivalent representation as SDE and how you can merge the sparse approach with this um, SDE formulation. So this work um, is a collaboration with these two guys, Will Wilkinson and Anna Solin, that um, many of you have met in Alto University. Uh, but roughly, I'm going to go around uh, in house paper, so the sparse version of the ocean process, and it's an extension uh, of this paper. So, in a nutshell, to motivate the talk, the classic inference for GPs normally scales cubically with number of data points. When you do sparse GP, which I'll describe later, you can introduce a number of variable M that you control that can give you good quality approximation, and, but then that also uh, controls the complexity, computational complexity of the algorithm, and that become now linear in the number of uh, data points, and you can mini batch and only scales uh, uh, quadratically and cubically um, within this number you choose M. So this gives great speed ups. On the other hand, when you work with Markovian GPs, and this is for uh, time series, um, you scale linearly with a number of data points, which is great. And when you combine the two, which is what we do here, you have uh, uh, some good features of both worlds, which is you are linear in both this number of uh, inducing points you put, and you're still linear in the number of uh, data points you can mini batch, and so things are very fast computationally. That's for the motivation. Now, the high level presentation of what we do when we talk about modeling with Gaussian processes. Um, so a Gaussian process is a prior of a function. You can imagine a distribution of a function from which if you sample from you from a, a class typical um, Gaussian process, you would have this many these functions and they all have a sort of similar smoothness and this is controlled by the by the feature of the of the kernel, the property of the kernel. So you can encode various things such as periodicity, magnitude, smoothness, and other things. Here uh, are some samples, and normally you are then given data, and you assume um, these data points uh, are somehow uh, indirect view of the function at the corresponding input. So if here it's a 1D thing, imagine the x-axis is like time and you're given, so time and y. And you have an observation model that tells you how the function is related to this data point. It gives you this likelihood, probability of y given the function. And what you do when you do a Gaussian process regression, when you do the inference part is you somehow weight each of these initial functions that I showed you um, by uh, how much 
they match this criteria, which is to uh, explain the data well. And so close to the data, you only select the function that goes very close, uh, that are very close, and uh, in between the function are more uh, free. So you you end up with uncertainty where you haven't seen the data. This is a very hand wavy uh, description. The more formal thing you're computing is this posterior, the probability of the uh, function given the observed data, and it's given by Bayes rule. And in some cases, you actually have it close form. Um, so you know the statistics of like the mean posterior, mean posterior variance and uh, covariance. Um, if you, uh, in the example I gave you with the closed form solution is in the conjugate case. So you have, as I told you, you have the data Y, F of Xi plus some noise, Epsilon, and it's Gaussian noise. The F is a Gaussian process and uh, you can actually write down the, these quantities that I didn't introduce, but it's a probability of the data under the model. And then you can write down, uh, you can compute the prediction in new points unseen. Um, and you have a closed form solution and what the structure of it doesn't really matter. What you, what you should see is um, this, you need to compute the um, matrix of all pairwise evaluation of this uh, kernel for all the inputs of the training data. So it's an n by n, n, by n matrix. This here is KFF and you need to uh, invert it. So that's a, a com computation scaling cubically uh, with the number of data points. This is the bottleneck, the classic bottleneck of uh, inference with Gaussian processes. Actually, there are two programs here. Uh, one is this only works in the case of uh, Gaussian observ observation noise, so this epsilon being Gaussian. And the, pro the other problem is uh, scalability, which I mentioned. And uh, approximate inference is um, trying to tackle the tractability one. And the sparse Gaussian processes have been introduced to um, tackle the scalability issue. So, just to give them a little zoo of things we want to be able to do um, that are that allow you that you're allowed to do with if you go beyond the classic regression case for example heteroscedastic um some data sets you might have a typical trend in your data but also the noise might be varying so this is called heteroscedastic this is not the classic uh, constant noise regression case and so you have two latent this is a complex likelihood and we want to be able to handle this kind of models. Another interesting model is multi-output. So I give this example of imagine you observe this some neuronal activity. First it's spikes, so you don't want to be Gaussian, but you observe many neurons, but they all sort of are working together. So the effective dimensionality of what's going on is quite small. For example, you see a bump in the middle where there is one bump that explains what happens in like a good share of the neurons. So in the end, you want to learn like maybe five times series to explain 50 of them, uh, which is also um, a different observation model. And maybe finally, um, you might go want to still have a Gaussian noise, but if you have multiple time series, you might want to have a, instead of independent noise across the function, you might want to have correlated noise. So these ellipses, uh, for those who are familiar, maybe re represent the covariance between two uh, time series as a function of time. So when it's axis aligned, it means there is no correlation. And as with time, maybe um, the correlation change uh, and you want to learn uh, this change of correlation. And this is a typical V-sharp likelihood and it's complicated to deal with, but uh, we can with uh, the approach I will describe. That's for the motivation. Uh, how we're going to do that? It's about doing uh, approximate inference. So we saw earlier that um, we want to compute this object, which is a posterior, given the data observation, and it's proportional to this likelihood term and the, and, and the prior. And we're going to build something to appro approximate this quantity, this Q of f. So when you do a, um, 
when you decide to do this deterministic type of approximate inference, you're left with uh, many choices. And first is what's, how do you choose this approximate, approximate family? You're going to choose the family of four cubes that you're going to uh, and find the, to find the best within this family. Uh, you're going to choose it to be some low rank family. And, um, and then how are you going to choose to learn it once you've chosen the family? And there are many ways, uh, variational inferences from expectation propagation, Laplace approximation, um, to cite a few. I'm going to focus on, on mostly variational inference, but I'm going to touch on, on the other ones. So um, now I'm going to talk more about uh, the structure which was the first step in this uh, two steps I described. So first is you choose a, choose a form for the approximation. And, and then I'm going to see how we can actually uh, learn it. So uh, sparse GPs, um, I put a very early reference now, but there have been more work since, is about um, using some deterministic features of a uh, Gaussian process. So here, imagine you have f is a process and you have phi takes this process and output to um, a vector, so a finite dimensional vector of uh, real values. You could, uh, and so they are this deterministic feature of the, the process. And then you condition, you, you want to build a conditional, predict the, um, I don't know if you see my mouse, but Build the conditional that if you fix a value, a given value for this feature, what's the value of the process um, elsewhere? You want to put um, a distribution over these uh, features and marginalize it out. So this QU here is a distribution you're going to control. You, you use a, a prior that's given by you by the, the choice of the kernel and by the choice of the feature. So this is fixed. So now you're left um, to, uh, to learn a distribution over this feature. So depending how many features you use and the property of the features, this is going to allow you to um, construct a good enough, a rich enough, uh, expressive enough approximation to the, to the posterior. Um, a typical example is, which is a classic example, is choosing phi as function evaluation at a few sets of points, not all the data points. Um, so the normal posterior is actually choosing uh, phi as all the function evaluation at all the data points. The sparse version is selecting a subset of, of pseudo points that doesn't exist in your data set and that you're able, uh, able to control that you're typically going to put where you have data around where you have most of your data, but you're going to typically choose much fewer than uh, the total number of data set. This is because there is a lot of redundancy in the data. So you, an example is function evaluation. Another example is uh, of some deterministic feature is the Fourier transform uh, at a given frequency. So now instead of having features indexed by a position in the input space. I have a, um, some features indexed by uh, some frequencies in some other domain. So this is typically called interdomain. There are many uh, features that have been proposed that have various uh, consequence on the resulting algorithm, but the purpose here is not to, to review this. Um, so uh, in this slide, what matters is this um, as a structure of this um, approximate posterior. You, once you choose this number of features, you set the complexity of the model, which is unlike a typical Gaussian process posterior, which normally has a complexity, uh, inherent complexity that increase that actually scale with the more you put data, the more you, the complexity increase here, you set it by fixing M. So it has, uh, you fix the total capacity it can have. Now, next step is to choose 
what's going to be this QEU, this distribution over the features that we want to learn. Typical choice is to have it Gaussian, then everything remains uh, in the Gaussian world because the conditional of a Gaussian process is a Gaussian. So if you choose QU to be Gaussian, then Q of F is a Gaussian process, just a low rank one. So typical choice is choose QU as a big Gaussian uh, the, that you parameterize mean covariance of Scholesky factor and you optimize. Another is through uh, sites. So you choose um, QU to be a product of the prior and then terms that deviate from the prior. So if these terms are just constant to one, then you're back to the prior. And as you introduce uh, uh, some value, it deviates from the prior. But the base, the default thing is uh, being, close, being close to the prior. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to show you how you can use both of these formulation. What I, um, I, I talked to you about being Gaussian and what we'll see is that it's very interesting in the site based uh, version to use the natural parameterization of the Gaussians. Because when you have a, a prior, it's typically a centered Gaussian, which density can be expressed as a quadratic form with a precision matrix. And if you have sites that are also in this form, then when you do the product of the densities, you sum the statistics. So now the, the statistics in this U transpose U are K, K inverse and the statistics of this site. So um, product in density is just sum in natural parameterization and we'll talk about this later. Okay. Now, when you have chosen this sparse, um, Gaussian process, and um, you use you do variation inference. I'm not showing you how you derive this bound, but you can derive a bound um, to the marginal likelihood, and this is this bound is LQ. This bound depends on the marginal of this approximate uh, posterior and on the uh, this QU that we we introduce that the density over the features. This bound, uh, so it's a lower bound to the evidence. And as you try to maximize it to get to touch the bound, the optimal is to have this Q to be, as uh, a process to be actually the, the exact posterior. So what we do here is we try to maximize this bound over Q. And um, at the end, we have a proxy for the marginal likelihood and we have uh, uh, the best approximate posterior we can get. So typical thing we do here, we choose QU to be some form, Gaussian, and then we do some, some form of gradient descent. Uh, when we mini batch, we do stochastic optimization, we use Adam. Uh, so it's some flavor of this. Uh, we choose a le some learning rate and uh, we just run down. Um, and uh, I'm, I want to introduce then something that works quite well is to do natural gradient. And for that, I need to introduce the fact that when you, it's introducing the geometry of the Gaussian distribution. When we do classic gradient descent, this can actually be seen as uh, doing a step following the gradient, uh, but also not being too far from the previous value of the parameter we were. So this is a penalty to not being, as we do a step, to not be too far from the previous value. And this is just uh, following the, the gradient. And this is really just a, uh, you can think, if you try to minimize that, you'll see you get exactly this rule. Now, being not too far from a parameter, the previous parameter, when you do a step in, in the in I don't know in in mean and Scholesky doesn't re makes really sense this Euclidean norm. What does it mean to be close? You can make a tiny step in in Euclidean norm, but completely change the uh, shape of and the coverage maybe of the Gaussian distribution. But you can do a step of equal norm that actually changes nothing of the distribution. Uh, and I'm 
an example is if you have a, a very tilted Gaussian and if you move the mean along its main axis, you don't do incur much a change in distribution, but if you move it sideways, you, you change completely the coverage. But so one way to take the geometry into account is to actually change this uh, penalty and uh, maybe add a KL, which is a, a measure of distance in, in, in distribution not distance exactly, but, and this amounts to doing a gradient step, but modified by some, some quantities. That's the Fisher information matrix. Um, and this is done a lot actually uh, internally at Second Mind. Uh, I know Stefanos works a lot with that at least. And it typically helps you with optimizing. You, you don't have to choose a learning rate because it's adaptive. Um, and um, it, only, it only helps you. And one problem with that is this computation, you, which you don't implement as this matrix product, but an, another way in practice, still needs to perform um, transformation of Gaussian distribution parameterization going from mean, mean covariance parameter to uh, precision and so forth. And these are often not super stable numerically and may, may fail. And um, they're also costly. An alternative is what I'm going to present next and based on on uh, the sites. Not yet. This is a summary of what we typically do. So we do actually this natural gradient descent for this uh, um, typical mean Scholes key factor parameterization. So the other view, which I should let me, which you should let me unpack here. So if you look at the second line, we choose, instead of choosing Q, U, so the distribution over the uh, features to be parameterized directly by mean and covariance, we have this form with the prior and sites. And um, as I told you, now I wrote them a bit differently. If I write the natural parameterization of the prior as capital lambda and small lambda for the sites, then they just sum up. And what's really nice is if you do variational inference then, and this is the work of uh, MT, MTSCAN, um, you get that the update for the natural parameter of the site when you do a natural gradient step are just a linear update of a linear mixture of your previous uh, value of the natural parameter plus some gradient term G. And the G is actually only the um, variational expectation, the classical variational expectation, which is the, uh, the gradient of the first term in the elbow. So this is um, what is the expected value under your approximate posterior of the log likelihood. Um, what's great with, um, so M here should be N. So, uh, bear with me here. What is um, great with this is it's very simple and cheap to compute this uh, version expectation. The gradients are only uh, local, local term. Um, they are very stable and then the, this operation is also uh, super stable. So actually to my experience and my practice, this is cheaper and this works way better than the uh, global approach to um, variational inference. And um, it's natural gradient, so it's also, it also comes with uh, guarantees, which I, sh I haven't mentioned, because it has this adaptive uh, learning rate. Unlike if you just dump Adam, you're sure you're going to converge and, and stop somewhere. I think that's even true in the stochastic setting. Uh, you, so this is an instance of mirror mirror descent, there is a lot of literature in, on optimization about this. And um, 
you can have strong guarantees on, on your uh, performance here. So it, it's worth noting that the, the two approaches that you just described are exactly equivalent, right? The, yeah. the difference is that in the empties approach, you don't explicitly, exactly because you know the form of the posterior via the sites, and you just want to do a, a, a conjugate update, which is just the summation in the natural parameters. You don't need to compute any gradient with respect to KL term. You just, yeah. uh, th that's the extra benefit in the scale, in the speed that counts. So this is a, an extra ben computational benefit. So if you look at uh, my elbow here, it has, uh, so it has this rational expectation and the uh, KL term. In the previous the version, stack, so we cannot I see the slide. take the gradient no. of the whole thing. So yes, it's a gradient that includes the gradient of, of the KL, which uh, it's fine, we can do it because we have uh, automatic differentiation, we can backprop through any computation, but this is also potentially numerically unstable. Uh, gradient might be numerically unstable. Here we actually, the gradient we have to do is only with respect to the rational expectation. So this is, um, uh, you don't have to use the gradient of the full elbow. You just compute gradient of uh, the individual terms. So that's, uh, uh, that's a consequence. That, yes, yeah, thanks for point, pointing it out, uh, Stefan. Someone and said something. Sorry. Yeah, and, um, it's akin to the Opera and Archambault paper about the rational approximation revisited. The fact that you just appear to touch the diagonal term of the covariance. So uh, this is um, so. I guess an entry to answer that is if you look at this, uh, it looks like the site is gonna, for each, so n here might be a, in the most basic setting will be, n is gonna be the number of data points. So you will have a site per data point. And it's still a site that touches all the inducing points. So if you parameterize it uh, full ways and uh, you still need a, a matrix for each site, and that sounds crazy. You don't want n times m squared, uh, parameter, but that's not what happens, actually. Um, if you, I don't give the detail, but you can show that this lambda are gonna be rank one, if you think of the second order term. So these are gonna be actually a rank one matrix, uh, parameterized by only a scalar. And so this is, if you want the connection with Archambault, with this, you can show that you end up with a parameterization that's the cheapest you, you need. You, you actually have n parameters. 2n because you have one for the mean and one for the uh, covariance of percent. So in this sense, okay. uh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, you uh, so you have this uh, efficient parameterization. Uh, what I'm gonna. Uh, go for later is talking about site tying. So here having one site per data point, uh, and I tell you, you still have, you have N number of parameters, yet if N is big, N is too big, N is, might be worse than M squared, or so uh, when you go in large regime. So I'm gonna talk about ways to actually not have uh, uh, N terms, and this is called site tying, and you still preserve all the niceness of this method by doing that. And you actually then recover the computational complexity of the classic variational inference we're used to with a, um, um factor, typically scaling a M squared uh, storage, if that makes sense. Um, so now I'm gonna carry on on time. I'm not too bad. Now I want to talk about uh, another method, and I'm not going to go into that much detail, but it's expectation propagation is uh, another way to approximate um, the posterior. It's actually 
doing a bit more than approximating the posterior, it's trying to approximate the full joint, which means also including the normalizer. When you do versional inference, you don't really care about the normalizer. So I use here this uh, n tilde to say that I have parameters, the classic parameters of a Gaussian, but I also keep track of a, a normalizer. I just don't show it here. This is um, only approximately correct as well. Um, but so um, if you, um, I'm just going to give you the mechanics of uh, um, expectation propagation. So you have a uh, sites here. I've just summarized them all as uh, through the sum, but you have a different little t factor with each, its own lambda. And when you do EP, you are going to update each of these lambda separately. So you pick one n, and then you take your approximation and you remove one of the term. So one of the factor in the product of all the, uh, so in this product here, you're gonna, because it's similar uh, sort of structure, you remove one of the, one of the term. And this is very convenient if you are in the natural parameterization because that means you just uh, subtract a natural parameter from the, full parameterization. So you just sum over every one, ex every site, except the one you care about. And then to update it, you typically do a uh, KL minimization. So um, if it's hard to explain if you are not familiar, but when you, when you have your approximation, you, have, you, re you, you replace all your true little likelihood term by an approximate uh, by a site. And um, in EP, you remove one site and you put the true likelihood. And then you try to, uh, to learn um, how to update each site doing such, a, such an operation. Um, the aim is not to go into the detail of this. It's just to show that you have a, a local objective to compute. And actually, you can show that uh, uh, the doing the update a bit the same way that I, I mentioned earlier, you need to do the gradient of the rational expectation. Actually, you have a very similar thing. You just need to do the gradient of another quantity, which is, uh, looks like a rational expectation, except you, uh, you swap around the, the log and the expectation. So it's a log of the expected likelihood under your, your approximation. Um, but the updates can all be derived from um, gradient and action of this of this quantity. So the young, the reason I present this is to give a bit of a um, superficial uh, presentation of the mechanics of of EP and how why um, the natural parameterization help and how it, on a superficial level it also looks a bit, the update also look like you, you, there is a key quantity that you uh, need to take the gradient of to update your, your site. And it's not that complicated. Uh, most people find EP very complicated. Uh, this is often as opposed to the classic rational inference we're used to, where we uh, parameterize a Gaussian and what is if um, this has more uh, iterative flavor with local objective but so does rational inference that I presented with natural gradients, um, the efficient way. Uh, I'll pause here and I'll take question if there are any because I'm moving into a radically different section now. Uh, is there any comments? No, I'll carry on. So um, as a transition, uh, I try to motivate why in some case it might be interesting to not work with mean covariance, but uh, precision domain. And there is one world where precision is really useful and it's actually Markovian Gaussian processes. And the reason I'll describe in detail, but the precision of uh, Markovian Gaussian processes is actually sparse. And um, by sparse, I mean bended. So it uh, has very few parameters and um, um, computation with it can be done very efficiently. 
So uh, I'll show how actually using these precision-based methods for, for the case of marker and process is actually uh, very useful. So first, um, what are Markovian Gaussian processes? There are actually Gaussian processes that you can rewrite. So f is your scalar function, uh, k is your kernel, and you can rewrite it as f is equal to a projection, h is just a projection matrix, of a state, so something bigger, maybe a few dim dimensions. And this s is a vector that follows a dynamical equation uh, of this form. So if you didn't look at this last term, LW, this is just a ODE, so derivative of S equal F times S. This is a linear ODE. Now, and when you introduce a noise, W here is white noise, this becomes a stochastic differential equation. And the solution is not just a trajectory, it's a distribution of trajectories and uh, actually Gaussian. That's why it's still a Gaussian process. Um, when you look at standard GPs, you write down your probability of function evaluation, F1 to FT. There are, uh, it's like a multivariate Gaussian dense. It's with a full covariance. Uh, this means you have coupling through of all these values represented by all these uh, bits in a graphical model uh, notation. When you do the um, same thing, but with um, the SD representation, you have the states that actually have the Markov property, meaning that the next state, the future only depends on the most recent past. So the states have a chain structure, and then you can read out the F from each, um, from each uh, state. So you end up with a chain. And this is a very sparse graph as opposed to this fully connected graph. And the state typically will be often uh, composed of uh, the function evaluation itself and higher order derivatives. And it captures all you need to uh, predict the, the next state. Um, so I mentioned fully connected graph versus chain structure. Uh, this chain structure allows you to, for, to do uh, efficient inference going for using like forward backward algorithm and I'll, I'll go into that. But we're gonna do the same thing I was talking about earlier, doing inference in GP models, but we'll forget for a moment the kernel formulation and we'll uh, use S as a latent instead. Um, as just a little example, if you choose the matter one half kernel, pick some data. Actually, you, we care more about the input here. If you look at K, it's uh, dense. Now, if you look at uh, K inverse, it is just uh, three diagonal. So it has zero entry everywhere, except on the diagonal and the two uh, side diagonal. Um, that is great for storage. You don't need to store these guys. And for computation, when you, in, uh, when you do some solve product, you also only need to sort of loop through the active entries. So all these operations that normally scale like square or cubically with the number of, with N, the size of the square matrix, uh, now scale linearly. Now, um, I initially presented sparse Gaussian processes, and now I presented you these SD formulation of Markovian pro, uh, Gaussian processes. So I mentioned sparse twice. The first was about having M inducing points smaller than the number of data points. And the second one was this sparse graph of the chain of state versus the fully connected um, graph in the classic uh, formulation of the Gaussian process. And uh, one question in my life is, can you combine the two? And yes, and we've done this before here, uh, and we call it doubly sparse. And the idea is to work from the, start from the uh, SD formulation of Gaussian processes and use a particular type of 
inducing variable, instead of choosing the function evaluation or all the times, we actually choose full states. So we condition on, on uh, full states of this SDE. And that has a couple of advantages. If you go one by one, uh, first, when you do that, the marginal uh, distribution over this inducing state uh, is still just a state space model. So it's still a chain. It's this red arrows here. If you look at the distribution of U1, U2, U2, uh, till UM. And the second thing is now if you try to predict uh, an, a state given all the inducing states, you actually only depends on your on your nearest neighbor. So for example, S2 here, given U, all the inducing state only depend on U1, U2, and then S4 only depend on its neighbor and so on. So that means uh, this conditional uh, are not touching all the inducing variable as is often the case in classic uh, sparse GP, but only the most local uh, inducing variable. So that means this is why you lose uh, in the variation in like the complexity of classic uh, SVGP. You have an m squared. So for each prediction, you still touch all the inducing points. You have the n m squared term, and here you just touch two. So this is a constant. So that's why you are, uh, your complexity is actually linear with them. Um, maybe I'll go through that again. So. When we use these inducing these properties uh, as a way to to variational inference, the aim is to compute this uh, elbow and optimize it. So what I mentioned first uh, is that P U is uh, the prior on the states is still a Markov chain, and you can show that this the optimal thing to do is to choose a family for Q that's also a Markov chain. So that means your solution that you're going to optimize over and store is, is small. Um, that you need to compute for all the prediction, you need to compute not the full marginal over all the states, but all the pairwise marginals over a neighboring uh, state to use as inducing variable. And this has also linear computation in a number of them. And uh, why do you use them? Well, it's to do all these local uh, uh, predictions that you need to compute the variational expectation. So you see your expectation over your prediction for it. And it's you, for that you need prediction of the individual states. And uh, so this costs you also something linear in both the uh, inducing variable to first compute the Q and then these are parallel, you can do them separately. So it's also just plainly linear in the number of uh, prediction you want to make. Uh, I have 10 minutes more, so I hope I won't be too long, but this was an example of the initial paper uh, where we uh, demonstrate what it means to choose this state inducing uh, points. So in black are, uh, in red are data, is data, and in black is the inducing location input, and then how much, what's the, it's trying to capture what's the, what's the information captured by each of these inducing states. And actually, a state contains information about not just the value of the function, but also its derivative and its second order derivative or more, depending on the kernel. So that's what we try to uh, convey with this figure, where you see that uh, around each dot, I, I, I draw a little parabola. And uh, the parabola captures the information about, it's like a little Taylor expansion that captures information about the value, the derivative, so how it's going to carry on, and the second order derivative, so whether it's curved or not. So you need, you often need uh, less inducing inputs uh, than you would if you would use classic function evaluation to achieve uh, the same sort of complexity and, and uh, representation power. And also, as I mentioned, the scaling is uh, computational scaling is is linear, so it's much faster. Uh, here is another example we had in also in the previous paper. If we can do data imputation, if we train on all the data except in the 
gray area. And then we try to fill in. Uh, if we have rich enough kernel, it can learn complex behavior such as this periodicity. This is a sp speech signal. And uh, um, it also does it quite efficiently. You can have long signal and it's just, everything is linear with the number of data. So that's very fast. Um, I'm gonna skip this for time, but this is comparing the scaling and storage of different algorithm. Um, so the classic version of the sparse and our approach. And we are linear in time and number of using points as opposed to uh, this cross term and cubic term uh, with the number of inducing points in the classic approach. Just to say there are lots of other choice of inducing variable that might reduce this complexity uh, and you should check work at second mind because there is a lot done on this. This is for external people. Um, now, what I presented before the previous slides was the um, original uh, paper uh, on merging the SD approach with the sparse uh, Gaussian uh, sparse GP approach, and it used the it used Q parameterized in uh, in a in a direct way, so it was directly parameterized as a, as a Gaussian through conditioning, but uh, it wasn't as in the site based approach where you reuse the complete as a prior and then you introduce term uh, local terms. Well, actually, you can still do that here and uh, the first consequence of the structure is that your local term, your uh, per data point, uh, actually don't need to touch all the inducing points. So for each data point, you can have a term that depends only on your nearest uh, inducing state that reduce uh, complexity of the term. And um, now is, I'm talking about site tying. The fact that you have inducing states and a few data points in between each, this gives you um, a natural way to tie states. So here you see, you, if you take all the data points, many will fall in the same interval between two inducing states. And if you join them together and have a single site for, for these guys, this point, then you end up with not n factor, but m factor. And you should see that as sharing a site. So this term t, you can see it as a product of n times uh, nth square root of, uh, you know, tn to the power one over n. If, so if, uh, if, you, if you split this term as a product of the same quantity n time, then that's uh, what we do when we do sharing. I'm not sure that's clear, but um, when I do that, I end up with the same storage complexity as the classic approach, and I can still apply the fast natural gradient updates that I presented uh, before. Um, as a graphical representation, uh, of this, you have the prior that is still a chain here, a, con a connected uh, chain over the inducing states. And your posterior is approximated through sites. And here I represent as, as little factors. So you have for each pair of inducing points, you have a single site that touch uh, them, the two consecutive ones. So that's why you also have a a storage now that scales linearly with the number of uh, inducing points, inducing states, rather than uh, having one site per data point. How am I on time? I'm actually, I'm actually done. I think this. Um... So if you're fine with time. I think we started a bit late, like five minutes late. So we have ten more minutes. Sorry, I'm actually, I'm actually not done. Let me 
uh, I have two more slides, I think. Um, this sparse structure of uh, the precision when you work with um, stochastic differential regression allows you to do all the inference using recursion along the graph. They are often called uh, Kalman filtering, one extra n, and Kalman smoothing. Um, and there are other ways you can do things, which is also a paper we did here, which is to uh, use spec uh, specific operator for banded matrices, like for um, lots of operators that do linear algebra for banded matrices. And uh, a final point I wanted to say is um, we can also extend this work naturally to spatial temporal model. So it's not just time series, it's also uh, higher dimension. So how so? Well, we know that I, I presented you that uh, for a classic GP, you can write it as a, as a SDE. Well, for some for a Markovian spatial temporal GP, where the input is now some, some space and some time, you can write it as a stochastic partial differential equation. So what does that mean? Uh, in a way, you can think of a differential equation where it's not the vector that evolves over time, but it's a full slice. It's an infinite dimensional vector. Here, imagine this slice that evolves over time. So that does look like a complex quantity to, because if you have an infinite dimensional vector, it's hard to, um, to deal with, but you can do a sparse approximation of this infinite dimensional vector. And then, uh, the you only need to deal with the dynamic of the dynamics so the temporal evolution of a subset of points and uh, this turns down the infinite dimensional problem into a finite dimensional sde and we are back into the world where we know how to deal with things so um, this allows you to tackle uh, any sort of reasonably small uh, multidimensional uh, problems, but they are well suited for settings where you have time as a longer dimension. So, and that was my last slide. So as a recap, I, I, I talked about Gaussian processes, the sparse GPs, how we do it, and maybe how we should think uh, of alternative way to do it. And especially I've talked about uh, Markovian GPs for time series and how they can be, uh, this, the formulation can be merged with the sparse GP approach to uh, provide efficient uh, inference algorithm. And that's it for me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Vincent. That was great. Uh, are there any questions? I have a question. Um, is there any disadvantage to doing the site tying that you were talking about three three slides ago? You, so, rather um, than having one site per data point, having one one site per uh, mar like paired marginals. So I think um, I think you do, but in the same way that. Um, you do as soon as you introduce a sparse approach. I think that if you have inducing points and uh, still allow for a, a large number of uh, sites that scale with a number of data, you can still recover. I might be wrong here, but you can still, rec you, you, I don't know if either you can still recover uh, the complete GP, but I doubt it, or it's anyway redundant. So not, I would say, not doing the site tying uh, is not helping you. You're just gonna spread what you learn into different uh, different uh, factors, which you don't necessarily need to uh, to store. Actually, this is a better answer because uh, if you saw how the updates look like, uh, sorry, I'm gonna go here again. Here, this tells you. Uh, well, update the site for site n by taking the uh, variational expectation for uh, 
data point n and update it this way. And now when you do site tying, you actually just do that all together. And you, you, you could use, you could see just add the sum here. This gives you your sum site. Just add the sum term here. And uh, you add a sum on the, on the right as well. So basically since what you need in the end is the sum, it doesn't make sense to keep it a separate factor. You can directly do the sum. Um, I, I, I understand this is not directly uh, obvious, but this is, uh, this is what happens. Um, okay. So it's more uh, doing this with, so doing n sites when you do the sparse uh, approximation, when you use the inducing state is a bit redundant. It works actually very well. It's just, you store more things than you need to. Um, yeah, no, I think that makes sense because you've only got so much space to store the information, right? You're still only storing space in the M inducing. So you could, you can't like fit two lots of data in one inducing point. Yeah, in the end, as you see, you, you sum the things together, the contribution of each data point. Uh, you will, st uh, whether you tie or not, you will still need to do the gradient through all the data. And um, yeah. Okay. This was more like a, a, a way to introduce uh, the site uh, in a more classic way. Cool. But then how to tie is uh, another question because if you have data, uh, and no natural ordering, um, it's not clear how you would want to, uh, to cite tie. Uh, and there is a natural way to do that when you, um, when you have this Markovian structure. Because uh, uh, you, one thing is you could tie everybody, a single factor, but then it's less rich than if you have uh, different factor for different uh, parts of the data, for example. But it's less clear how you would do that in, a, in the classic, uh, classic approach, what's the best time. But there is, has been some work uh, uh, on that. Actually, you can, if you're curious, you can see, uh, not can, but actually more in the EP, EP framework, the work of, uh, Henry, yeah, and Rich Turner. Are there any other questions? I have a question. Um, <clears throat> so the, it seems to me there's something very special about 1D and Markovian, and that really makes things tractable. And you, at the end, you sort of said, oh, we could, we could extend this to uh, spatial components and, and let's say going up to a little bit higher dimension. Uh, yeah. So is it, is it really true that it's, I mean, the Markovian-ness is kind of messy when you try to go even from one to two dimensions. And I agree with you that you could do, a, you can do approximate inference, but what, is there any way of, even if, you, if you're Markovian in both dimensions separately, to actually do something with that in a, in a sort of exact way more than, it seems that there should be something there, but I'm, I'm not sure I've, I've really seen anything. Um, yeah, uh, so even thinking 2D, uh, become, it becomes hard. I mean, what's nice with the line is you can, if you put something, if you cut a line, then you've split uh, uh, the two sides. Uh, to do that on a plane, you would need full contour of full, uh, full actually infinite dimensional line to split uh, um, to split the, the space. And uh, so I think there is no, no easy way to go. Actually, maybe what, what, what we already do by having inducing points spread a bit around on the 2D space uh, uh, for norm, normal GPs uh, is the best we can do. Uh, then we have the problem that to, pre for, to predict any data points, then you depend on all the inducing points. There is no way to, uh, 
to have a subset, uh, or you can artificially introduce that. And there is also work by, uh, by Rich Turner, actually, with this tree structure approximation, um, who actually partitions the space in a, a bit arbitrary way, uh, which is not super satisfying. But uh, if it does what you want, uh, and if it depends on what's your goal, but I, I don't see any nice principled way of, of doing this beyond um, beyond uh, 1D and uh, yeah. Well, on I the same think... line, uh, how, do, you, do you care to comment about uh, what Carl said and compared to uh, a simple additive uh, process across different 1D Markovian uh, spaces? Um, do you have any intuition whether, I mean, it, it feels, as Carl says, that it's easier to learn. I mean, although your space will be much more restricted, but it feels easier to be able to learn different uh, uh, 1D Markovian space and combine them additively there than trying to learn a big uh, slice over a crazy uh, dimensional space. Yeah, so I guess where you're going is if you make stronger assumption on the function in 2D, for example, it's a sum of two independent function of each dimension. Uh, then typically, if you do further assumptions across each, you can end up with solving two 1D problems that you know how to do. Um, but... Uh, this is great if the additive assumption is what you want for your data, but uh, if not, then uh, yeah. So my, my, my experience, uh, that's my, my experience with additive models is that they're quite they're quite limiting. Like additive assumption is a huge assumption, and so I wonder whether you could do something which was sort of overcomplete somehow, that you could have, you know, an additive model with. With, with many things that you add, like even if you're only in a two dimensional space, then let's say you can add, you know, 10 one dimensional functions. Now, I'm not sure whether that there's, the, I mean, I could, I could imagine that maybe something could be done in that, in that. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I, um, I haven't really spent, well, I did think a lot about this, but uh, I haven't come up with uh, an interesting answer to you. Maybe yeah, you could have interesting features such as, value here, derivative along an axis or higher order um, derivative along some dimension and, and the variety of them, would they help? Uh, I, th I don't know if they would help with scalability. Maybe they would help with represent uh, express expressiveness. Uh, I am not sure. Um, I think perhaps we can allow one more question, but this would be it. Uh, anyone? I have a very simple one to, uh, to conclude. In the slide we have in front of us, when you parameterize the Gaussian by lambda plus the sum of the, the lambda, this is in precision space, right? So um, covariant space. this is in natural parameter, so uh, it's a bit of a stretch, but you should imagine that you have both uh, first you have two, you know, you have the precision and also the other natural parameter in the Gaussian. So I just stack okay. them. Uh, okay, that helps. But it's still the, the, the linearity is what you should uh, care about. Great, thanks. Okay, with that, let's close the seminar. Thank you, Vincent, very much. Uh, thank you. And well, have a, have a nice rest of the day, everyone. <laughs>